Well, hi, and welcome to my shop here on November 14th. I'm about to start the alignment process with this radio. At this point in the uh, restoration of its operation, uh, I think it's wise to do the alignment and find out just what the performance of the radio can be brought up to. And maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe at the end of this process, you know, we'll all be saying, hey, this radio's working great. That's it. It's over. On the other hand, we might discover something in the course of doing the alignment that indicates there's more problems in the radio. That one thing would be, it just doesn't ever become sensitive. The problems could be weak tube or stuff like that. There's, there's still things in here that need to be, need to be taken care of. But at this point, I think the uh, alignment is, uh, is a good thing to do. And to me, an alignment is an iterative process that you go through kind of repeatedly. There's iterations inside the iterations. But I may do the alignment now, discover problems in the radio, fix those problems, and then have to do the alignment again. So I'm not, not looking at doing an absolutely precise alignment this first time around, but uh, good enough to determine if there's problems in the radio that are interfering with its operation. That, that's kind of the deal. And I'm removing one possible problem, and that is bad alignment. It could be a bad alignment in here. It's not very likely, but could be someone else may have fiddled with it. Someone else did work on this radio. They, they may have done an ear alignment. Oh boy, that's not good. So we're going to do it following the instructions. Now here's the page of instructions. Essentially, we're working our way down this table of directions. This is telling me how to set the equipment, how to set up the radio, what kind of reading to take, and what to adjust, what, what actually needs adjustment. This comes in a number of, of basic steps. Uh, first step is to align the intermediate frequency stages in the radio, the core of the radio, you could think of it that way. Uh, that involves some coils that are inside these two big cans. And that, that's really what we'll be focused on today, is tuning those coils. Uh, the next step, uh, which will probably come tomorrow, is to do uh, is to begin doing the band alignments. And we might get through them all. There's, there's many, many, many steps to it. You notice the broadcast band, band A here, is at the bottom of the list. It's the last thing that we're doing. So we have to do these things in order as presented on the sheet uh, for the outcome to be good. There can be you know, cascading effects, if you like. If you don't, you don't do these first four steps first, instead you do these first, you might never get a proper alignment out of the radio. So um, lots of uh, verbiage all around it. Uh, side instructions and things like that. One of the things about these uh, these uh, instructions is they're they're written for repair people uh, to implement. And I guess the designers and the uh, you know top engineers that were in the factory and in the uh, design office understood that out in the field, people didn't have the greatest equipment. Uh, they didn't have a shop even as good as mine necessarily. Almost certainly they didn't. And often their voltmeter consisted of something like this. This is a pretty good voltmeter. Um, so now somewhere on here I think it gives a rating. Oh, maybe not. Usually you can find an ohms per volt rating on a, on a voltmeter, especially an older one like this. Radio City Products New York City, USA, model 442. I, I don't see that it says somewhere. It should say somewhere on here basically how much resistance this, this has. Cheap meters are low resistance meters. That may weigh in this one, but this one I don't think. Ooh, something coming out there. I don't think this one. This is a good meter actually. It works well. Uh, I don't normally use it though. Because the input impedance is fairly low, and when you connect it to the radio, you're connecting something the radio can feel, uh, and it will change its operation. And the curious thing about that is, you attach the equipment, things have changed in the radio. It's not readily obvious that that has happened. And so you can continue on doing your alignment work, and uh-oh, when, you, when all is said and done, and you just play the radio, it doesn't work well. And that's because of the effect of instruments. That's why in here it says 
this is what I believe anyway. Cathode ray alignment, what we would call an oscilloscope. Cathode ray alignment is the preferred method. They don't explain why it's the preferred method. Connections for the oscillograph are shown on the schematic diagram. Yes, they are. We won't be able to read this. There's a little note here and an arrow pointing to that spot. That spot, if you just trace the wires, is the very same as the start of the volume control or the input end of the volume control. It's very typically the right place to measure these kinds of things. But there's another measurement that can be made there, and that's a measurement of the AVC voltage, the automatic volume control voltage. This, this voltage is reflective of the strength of the signal coming out of the circuits that we are going to align. So if you watch the voltage, it was on this meter in the last video, as you make the alignment adjustments, this voltage will go up and down. And you just want it up as high as possible, indicating the strongest signal is getting through these coils. The, uh, the problem with that is if, you're, if the AVC meter is responding, if you're developing an AVC voltage, you must be putting in a fairly strong signal on the antenna from the signal generator. Or in this case, when we're doing this alignment, we're actually injecting a signal into the middle of the radio, not, not in the antenna, but into one of these tubes. Um, generally, you want to do this with the lowest level of signal. I should turn on my signal generator and get it, get it started up here. Because the higher the level, the more the AVC and the uh, more you're tuning the radio up for loud, strong signals. You don't need to tune the radio so well for loud, strong signals because they're loud and strong. You need to tune the radio up for the weak signals. So you're always instructed to use the weakest signal possible on your signal generator to get a desirable output. And they're suggesting use the oscillograph, no, I'm sorry, the cathode ray alignment, uh, because these oscilloscopes, even the old ones, like there's mine up here, the old ones, I have another one sitting on my bench over there, and I have a couple more underneath my bench. <laughs> Got a couple of real oldies underneath my bench, too. Well, those things have a very high input impedance, which means they don't load down circuits that you hook them up to very much. They don't disturb a radio very much, so you could connect it up and uh, and get a good result. So if you have one of these instruments in your shop, the writer of this knows it's a high impedance device. So there's a go ahead and use that, maybe like a voltmeter, um, or you could even use it to trace out the response curve, which is what we're eventually going to do here. Tracing out the response curve requires a sweep generator. We're going to be starting with a non-sweep fixed frequency generator. We're going to use the fixed frequency technique uh, to, to do the alignment on this radio. The IF alignment. IF stands for intermediate frequency. So, uh, you know, one of the tricks in these radios, in all radios, all modern radios, is only the very front end gets tuned to the signal you're receiving. The rest of the radio, where most of the amplification is going on, is actually set to a very fixed frequency. In this case, it's 455 kilohertz. That's very, very common frequency to use for this. And it doesn't change. It doesn't matter how you tune the radio. The intermediate stages are tuned to 455 so kilohertz. So the trick is to convert the incoming signal Maybe you're listening to uh, six, 680. That's a state. That's an AM station from Toronto. Convert it from the frequency it is, 680, down to 455, where it can then find its way through these through these coils here. So and that, that's done with a local oscillator, another oscillator, like a little radio station inside the radio. And as you turn, turn the knob, one of the few things you're doing when you turn that knob is you're changing the frequency of this local oscillator. So now you have this local oscillator with a signal, and you have the incoming antenna signal, and you want to get 455 out of it. It just so happens, if you pass two signals through, 
nonlinear devices, or if you mix them in a particular way, you'll get two more signals out. Two more, two more. Can I do it? You get four signals out. You get the original antenna signal, 6, 680, if you like. That's the example we're using. The local oscillator, which might be running at, I'm going to make it up, 1100 kilocycles, well, well above this. And you get the difference between the two of them, whatever that might be. So if you tune the local oscillator up and down, that difference frequency is going up and down because of the, radio, the way the radio is built and the intention of the designers. There's a point where there will be 455 kilohertz between these two signals. You take 680, add 455 to it, get some number, dial the local oscillator to that number, and you'll be producing the difference frequency of 455 kilohertz. You'll also be producing the sum frequency, so you add these two together, so you have 680 and 1100 watt, whatever this would be, add them together at 17, 1800 or something like that, you'll get that too. You end up with four, four signals. But beyond this point in the radio, which is fairly early in the radio, you glance at the schematic. It's so right around, right, right in here things change. That's where this mixing takes place in this tube. And the four signals are coming out from here and trying to get through the rest of the radio. Only one of them can make it the 455 signal, 455 kilohertz, because the rest of the radio is tuned to that frequency. And the others can't be heard. They are, in a sense, rejected. A couple other ways they, they're, they're quelled, too. So you end up with just 455. So it's really important that this part of the radio be tuned to 455. If you tune this to something else, let's say 470, then what will happen is, instead of looking for 455 between the signals, the radio is looking for 470. So you'll need the local oscillator a little further away. But to get the local oscillator further away, you've, you've, you've adjusted the dial. And the dial will no longer be pointing at the right frequency. It won't be pointing at 680 anymore. In a radio built for 455, if you follow all that. Most of the time, the IF in these old radios is still okay. It's, it's, it's not bad. Occasionally, people have fooled with it. They, they, there's an adjustment on the top here, which you can just reach in with your hand and turn. There's a hidden similar adjustment down here. You'd have to have a radio right out like this to, to, to adjust it. But nevertheless, sometimes people are doing this, or they're doing it with incorrect equipment, or they're doing it incorrectly, period. And they're listening to the result. Sometimes they don't use any equipment. They don't have any, so they're just lit. they tune in a radio station and just turn these things to make it louder. And that this can be the situation with a radio that reaches my bench. The situation with this one, we don't know. We we don't know. We know somebody worked on it. We know they changed parts. There's a chance they tried to align it. Just acquiring this information, by the way, today is easy, right? You go on the internet. This is from. Uh, radio museum, just, you know, it's easy. 25 years ago, not easy. Not at all easy to get that information. So so there's a whole period there and, and a problem with equipment and just a whole thing that could lead to a poorly aligned radio This at this late stage in its extended life. So what's inside these big cans? So I don't have a big one to show you, but I have a small one. This is the same thing, just just much, much smaller in a more modern radio. Pull out the insides, and you get something like this would come out. So this is basically two coils. You can see the one coil here, the other coil is just above it here. They're spaced a very particular distance. This is a highly designed piece of stuff. Uh, this is not a random thing by any means. And inside, you can see the dark, the dark piece in there. So that's a slug made of some kind of material that affects uh, electrical signals, either magnetically, well, it would be magnetically, I believe. And what you do is you move these slugs up and down in the tube here in order to align or adjust or tune the, the transformer to get the kind of performance that you want out of it, to make it work at the right frequency and to get the most out of it also. 
So that's what's going on here. These, these are in here, only they're much larger, much more dramatic, in fact. They're much cooler looking often. The little tiny things, they just, they're too tiny to look cool. So, um, we're going to inject a signal of, of 455. First, we're going to find out what this is actually tuned to, but I'll set this close to 455 here. Okay, that's really close to 455, all right. The output from the signal generator is coming over on this wire, and it's being fed into, as I mentioned, kind of the middle of the radio. It's being fed into the grid of this tube. This tube is this one. I notice it's sitting between the two cans. It's also sitting between the two cans on this diagram. That's one of the coils there, and that's the other one. And I'm feeding the signal into this tube. It's going to continue on this way. It doesn't go back. This part of the radio is just being ignored during this test. And actually, all we're really doing is putting a signal into this IF transformer here. There's one of these guys. So, so the output will go through a detector. A detector is just a rectifier. A rectifier rectifies AC voltages. Doesn't matter if they're 60 cycles or 60,000 cycles. Rectify it and produce a DC voltage. In these radios, they design that so the DC voltage that's produced is negative relative to the zero point of the chassis, or however you want to look at it. The negative voltage is very useful in controlling some of the tubes, some of the very first tubes. So even though we're down here generating this, this voltage, it's uh, down reading here, the voltage, the this rectified DC voltage is fed back to the grids of one or more of these front end tubes. What that negative voltage does, it increases the bias in the tube and reduces the tube gain. Now that's where they get the volume control from. So a strong signal coming out results in a DC voltage fed to the start of the radio to basically turn it down. Now, this is evident. To anybody who's tuned an AM radio, it's very evident. As you tune in an AM station, the radio goes from making a lot of noise to becoming quite quiet. Like the noise just disappears, and then you listen to the radio station. Now, I used to think when I was a kid, the radio station was knocking out the noise. But that's not at all what's happening. What's happening is, as the radio station signal starts going through the radio, it produces this AVC voltage at the rectifier detector. And that voltage is being fed back to some of the first tubes, and they are turning down the radio. And not unlike turning the volume down. It's done just a little bit differently. The effect is the same, though. The noise begins to go down as the signal begins to come in gives you the impression the signal is knocking out the noise, but that's not really what's happening. If it didn't do that, if it didn't have this automatic system, your hand would have to be on the volume control the whole time you're tuning a radio. When I'm listening to shortwave, uh, one of my bigger radios, it has a switch where I can turn off this automatic volume control system, AVC system. And I turn it off, I take direct control over the output volume, I do it using an RF gain control, which I won't go into. And I get a much, much better experience listening to radio. Because when you tune off a station, instead of the radio cranking the volume way up and you hear all this noise coming out, when you tune off the station, the noise level doesn't change at all. And if you have things set so it's fairly quiet when you're listening to the signal, as you tune away, it stays quiet. And these signals, as you come across them, seem to rise up out of the silence. And there they are. The near silence. There's always a little bit of noise. But the roar is gone. It's much more pleasurable to do that. A lot of radios, you cannot turn off this automatic volume control. It's not something that your average listener is interested in. But if you're a real radio listener, a shortwave listener, or something like that, there are lots of times where you don't want this uh, automatic volume control uh, operating. So that's kind of a, a talk look at the IF system here. Uh, is, all radios are built this way. Almost all of them have two IF transformers, but some might have three. My, uh, my big old uh, military shortwave radio 
I think it has four, four stages, um, which just reduces, uh, ends up in a better and better radio. And I won't go into it in too much more detail than that. So the, these slugs, then this one you would get at by sticking something like this into it. And then you can turn the slug, which is threaded, and will move up and down in the tube. And you come in from below and do the other one. Or with a lot of these, they're actually open in the middle. See, you can see right through it. So you can come in the top, and you can go right through and get down into the bottom slug. And the reason for that is you don't have to have the radio flipped up like this. In fact, it could still be sitting in its cabinet, potentially. Or this kind, this is so modern, this would be mounted on a board. It's just much more convenient to do it all from the top. Can't do that with these. Uh, a lot of these, uh, instead of having a slug inside the tube, they actually have a trimmer capacitor mounted over the top which you can access through a hole in the top with a screwdriver. But you cannot put your screwdriver all the way through and get out the bottom. You have to come in from the bottom for the other one, which will be mounted down here. It'll be two uh, trimmer capacitors. But this guy has slugs, but they are not open in the middle. You cannot push a tool through it. If you look here, at this brass looking thing right down here. So that's a uh, got a screwdriver slot in it. Stick a screwdriver in it, turn it, and you'll be turning a, a, a slug uh, inside that coil. That's what's happened. Okay, just so the some of the mystery is, is removed here from what I'm doing. Okay, uh, so let's just turn on some more stuff. We're going to leave the scope out of the picture right now. We're going to do this first time with just measuring a voltage on the uh, hmm. looks like there was a tiny voltage left in the radio. Oh, you can't see the meter. Okay, you missed a small thrill. Somehow this wasn't on zero to begin with. Okay, so it's zero now. This is monitoring the AVC voltage. Okay, I think we're all set. I'm just looking everything over. What's this doing here? This is doing nothing. This was measuring the plate voltage of the tube yesterday. Okay, I'm not going to use this. We're going to use... This might be the perfect one. Nope. So if you look at the end of this, you see the screwdriver type slot in there. This should fit very nicely right over top. There, so it goes in. Kind of holds on to that a little bit. I don't think I can let go of this tool, but that's the one we're going to use. Some of these slugs could even be in something like this, can be very sticky. And if they're sticky, then it becomes a problem using plastic tools to turn it. This is a pretty stiff tool. It's not bad. This will probably work fine. But these slender, flimsy guys here, you can twist them. And you get a twist in it, and you're going to have problems with the slug popping back and forth instead of moving nice and smoothly because you want to you want to tune this right to the right spot okay I could keep talking here but I don't think I should let's turn on the radio and uh, get things going here so we'll put the volume down now the instructions um, suggest that you monitor this tone at the speaker and the reason for that is they think you're using something like this. And you can't put this meter on the ABC circuit because it's too high in impedance, the circuit. And this is too low of an impedance, the meter. 
So they say, oh, put your low impedance meter on the speaker. The speaker can't affect anything back in the radio at all. So, and surely to goodness, this is not going to load down a speaker. The speaker itself is only 8 ohms or 4 ohms or something like that. And this is thousands of ohms. So that's why they say, stick it on the speaker. I don't like doing that myself because then you have to really listen to this. <laughs> listen to it uh, at some volume. So here we see the ABC voltage is up. What's the radio doing? Okay, so it's already playing the sound from my signal generator. And just to convince you of that, so that's a 400 hertz tone. That's usually what they like you to do these at, 400 hertz. Um, what I, what I want to do, I'm going to get both the frequency on the camera a little bit X. Okay, so you can see this meter and you can read those numbers and if I do this. So the number there is 0.454. Now I'm going to vary the frequency on the signal generator and I have to move the camera because I have to stand where the camera is. So I'm going to move the frequency around until this meter is as high as it'll go. Okay, here we go. Down. Okay, so that's as high as it will go. Now if you look at the frequency, it's a little off, 455. Uh, my frequency counter is off also. 454 is what we're aiming for. Is that far off? No, that's not far off. Is that so much it would ruin a radio? No. Now another thing I gotta do is I gotta put this guy on full supply voltage here. Turn down the tone. This will have affected this this reading. We will repeat this. Should not have caused any change. But let's just see where the peak occurs. Okay, so that's the peak. Uh, that's the same number. 452. And now we want to be doing this with the lowest signal coming out of the uh, signal generator. Whoops, I have to move this again. So I'm going to start one-tenth. So there's one-tenth. If I turn the volume up though, it's still there. I have a much lower ABC voltage because a much lower signal. If I go another uh, one-tenth. Very low voltage here. Still here, Tom. So make this meter more sensitive. We'll work at this level. And I'll adjust the frequency again and see where the peak is. So the existing peak is, well, now it says 451, but that's not much different than 452, is it? Now, we're only sending the signal into this tube and through this can. This is the only can that we need to adjust right now. So I'm going to set the frequency to where it should be, 455. Okay, that's 455. We weren't paying attention to the meter, but it probably dropped a little wee bit. I'm going to adjust. I'll start on the bottom because uh, because it's right here. So th this kind of adjustment is normally done in the factory last stage of producing the radio, manufacturing the radio. And uh, normally not ever done again. My tool is not going in there. What's, what's going on? Something funny about that? What's the story on that one? Let's take a little bit of a closer look here. Something funny about that.
Oh, there's some gook in it. How did that happen? Um, though it's not normal, nor it's not a normal thing for these to be gooked up or painted or uh, glued in some way. That must be some goop that has fallen onto it. It should look like this one. This is the one up above. Nice and open. I want to pick that stuff out of there. And see, it just goes to show you never know what the challenge is going to be. How am I going to get that out of there? How do I know this even needs to be adjusted? I don't really know until I try. So how do I gun? It's really in there. Let's just look at the two the top of the cans. Just to be sure nothing funny is going on there. Now you can see how easy it would be to get in there. See that bent piece of metal running past it there? Uh, that's a spring pushing on it to kind of lock it a little bit. So A, it doesn't shake around, and B, it doesn't rotate on its own over time. Especially during transportation from the factory to the store, from the store to the house, and up that flight of stairs. Bang, 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 all the way up the flight of stairs. Okay, uh, what exactly that goop is down here? I don't know. Is there any other goop around? Did more of it? So, think about it now. This radio is in a funny position. It's on its side. Normally, we'd be looking straight up. So this goop would have come down from inside. Maybe, ooh, that's not a good sign. So the there are some tubes that receive their plate voltage through these coils and under certain circumstances the uh, plate current can go high can, can become uh, uh, too much it's going through these coils ultimately can burn them right out which is a sad situation for a radio like this or maybe just heat them up a bit maybe that's what's happened here and the goop has flowed down from up above you know, inside the inside the structure that's inside there. I don't know. I don't know where the goop would come from. Okay, I gotta stop and degoop it. I want some kind of de degooping thing, and I better turn it off because I think this is gonna be a little bit of a rugged thing I'm gonna do in there. Well, it turns out this material is hard. It's not oily. You can see it flexing there. I thought maybe I'd just be able to kind of poke it off, but uh, goes. I poked that off. Excellent. There we go. I'm pretty sure now I should be able to fit this right on here. Yeah. Now let's see if, it, if I can even turn it. Oh, there it goes. You heard it crack a little bit. Okay, back to work to work here. Okay, radio back on. I'm taking little tiny breaks now and then, as you're probably aware. I'm running in my uh, rec room watching my TV for five minutes, something like that. Watching May Day, one of my favorite shows. Or I think in some countries it's called Air Accident Investigation. I think it's the same, same show. So I get to watch people investigating airplane accidents, and then I come in here and do my work on the radio. Okay, I think she's warmed up. Get her reading on the meter. Signal generator is running at 455. Okay, we're ready. 
Now, it's not just one slug, there's two here that need to be adjusted. Watching the meter now. You can hear it. You can hear it more than you can see it. Okay, so it went up a little wee bit. I have to move the meter here. So I'm going to go in the top adjustment now. And watching the meter again. This one doesn't want to turn. I'm using a plastic tool to do this and uh, if it's going to resist this much yeah, I'm going to get a regular screwdriver well not a regular screwdriver, a nice little wooden handles old guy, old screwdriver for old radio generally speaking if you got these metal uh, screws sticking out of the top of these cans using a screwdriver is, is harmless. I, mean, I can't get this to go in. Is there something wrong with that one too? If you looked at it, it looked fine. The screwdriver is too, too fast. The blade is too fast. screwdriver you know it's a piece of metal I'm holding on to now it's not the best thing either but again uh, it doesn't affect the radio okay I'm in this is a small screwdriver hard to turn here we go watching the meter oh I can't turn it there it goes just a slight adjustment which, which I could hear. Of course, I'm the one turning the screwdriver, so I know what to expect. You could hear it get a touch louder. So now that's a very minor adjustment, all in all. A little better off. Now we're going to switch the signal injection from this tube to this tube. The signal will travel through this can and continue on through this tube, this can, and get out the speaker. But we've done this one, so we'll do this one next. To do that, I have to change the injection point. I think I'm going to turn the radio off for this. My sweaty hands. Why would my hands be sweaty? I'm not the guy crashing the airplane. Okay, pull this out. Now, I want to put it on the grid of the mixer tube, this tube grid is pin number 8. So I'm looking in at the tube. Pin number 8. Pin number 8 down in here. So I see the key. That appears to be grounded. Am I I'm on the wrong tube? I'm on the wrong tube. That's this tube up here for crying out loud. Come on. You're supposed to help me with this kind of stuff. Are you yelling at your screen? Wrong tube. Okay, looking up there now, pin number eight is Isn't where I had this hooked up already? <laughs> I have to play the video back. Right? So I may have been putting this through both cans. Yeah, I think I had it up here. So the, the whole time it's been going through both cans, but that's really okay. The instructions are written with the idea that the radio is way out of whack. And it's a long ways to bring it into whack. That's not the case with a radio like this. Especially because we heard it working, we know it's not way out of whack. So I'm going to fire the signal, and because I was lying before about putting it in this tube. I'm putting it in this tube, it's going through this transformer, then this tube, then this transformer. I've done this one, adjusted this one. We'll adjust this one now. 
don't think it's going to be a bad thing at all. Give the radio a moment to warm up. Try to think of some small talk. I started late today. See, it's already it's already 10:30 in the morning because my cat. Where's the signal? Because my cat wanted to be on my lap. I guess maybe I did have it hooked up to the right spot. Well, why are we not hearing it now? We should certainly hear it. Have I hooked it up to the wrong spot? I need a stronger signal. No, I shouldn't need. I should need a weaker signal at this point. Did I hook it up to the wrong spot here? Always a good possibility. Grid is on eight, and I am connected to one. Okay, yeah, got it. Got it wrong. Got it wrong. Got it wrong. Yeah, it has the green wire. That's right. And fish this in here. Yeah, you would never want to try to do this with the radio switched on because there's you can't you just can't watch every little bit of your hand and everything in the radio to know you're about to get a shot. find these clips uh, they like to wander around you know what there is there's a wire that's kind of in the way there now I can follow the green wire but it disappears into the back of the switch so there's no opportunity there and if I go right on the pin itself that's better that's better. Okay, so another thing I've done here, just, just something I do in my shop. You see how the, the wire coming from the signal generator, I have the ground up here. I don't have it down here. I have it up here so it'll support the cable and take the strain off this. We're just less likely to pull this somewhere unfortunate while I'm paying attention to other things. Watching this stuff on video is very different. You don't have to have your hands, your eyes staring at my hands all the time, but I do. I have to have my eyes staring at my hands. That's the way it works for all of us. When you're doing stuff, you're looking at your hands. What else is going on? Who knows? Who knows? Okay, I think we're set again. Let's try. Power on. This time we should hear it. Should be a little louder than last time because it's going through Another tube of amplification. Wacko, yeah, it's much stronger. Look what it did over here. Okay. Much, much stronger. So we're going to turn this guy down. So you can hear the hiss. Turn down the volume a bit. You don't really have to listen to it. Now we want to know for sure that this meter is reflecting the signal. So I am going to move the signal up and down a little bit. There you can see the meter moving. Perfect. Perfect. Now we'll adjust the second can to the bottom. Okay, I'm in. Watching the meter. So you could hear it click because it was frozen in place. So no, nobody's turned this for a long time. 
didn't really make an improvement. I'll try the top. Quite a change in the tone, causing the radio to, to, to tune a little bit left or right of where, to where it's intended, just a wee bit. But there we are, hardly any adjustment needed. That's a good sign. It says things in the radio haven't dilapidated all over the place, even though I've changed a bunch of capacitors. It still wants to be tuned exactly the same. That's, that's a good. That's good. Now what I want to do is uh, I want to repeat this, or at least check the wave shape uh, response curve. Right? It's a better response curve of these two transformers. So I'm going to set up for that, and uh, we'll see what we can see with that. Okay, I don't know how well I can explain what's what's happening now, but if you look at the scope there, you can see two signals. It's a dual trace scope. It's like two 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 scopes, two 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 scopes in one. One trace, the upper one, is showing the sweep output. From uh, you know, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna switch to a different camera here. Oops. Okay, it's a little better to look at. So. So this is a uh, signal that's coming from my uh, sweep generator right here. That is going to uh, become the sweep signal for the oscilloscope. Right now the oscilloscope is sweeping on its internal its internal setting. So all this is going to do, you see, it's, it's I know it's on the move here. I can settle it down a little bit. It's a ramp up and a sudden shot back and a ramp up and a sudden shot back when I flip this control to where it's going this signal will cause the uh, dot if you like the oscilloscope dot where's that dot there you can kind of see it sort of um, it, this is what will drive the dot across the screen and back really quick and then across back really quick and across as it's doing that this uh, sweep is matched with a change in the output frequency of the sweep generator. So the sweep generator, this is more or less the center frequency of the sweep. The start, and I need, need to check these anyway, the start should be at, I want 20 below 455, so it should be 445. How did it get down to that? So I adjust it upwards. This is a tricky unit to adjust. 35? 35 is where I want it. 30, 35. 20 below 55. Okay, so there we are. 435. And then the stop frequency, that's where it starts. Stop frequency should be at 75. It's just a little bit below. I guess this thing must have a bit of a drift in it. There we are. That's right on 475. I'm going to turn the sweep on. You can hear the sound coming out of the radio speaker. The sound of the sweep passing by. This is now the, roughly the center frequency of, of the sweep. As it passes by 455, the radio picks it up, if you like, or transmits it, that's a bad word too, sends it on its way to the speaker. So you don't really need to listen to it, but it's always reassuring to hear it. Now we're going to change this. Oh, hold on, I want to mention the... Uh, the lower one here is the, um, what is the lower one? Oh, it's not what I thought it was. So that's the speaker sound, but we don't want to, we don't want to follow that. Well, why not? I'm going to leave it just like that for now. I don't, don't think it's going to be effective. I'm going to change this now to XY setting. Expand this guy out. Get them in the center. And the center. So 
this is what's happening at the speaker. Uh, it's a response curve of some sort, but there's an awful lot of stuff in there. So what I'm going to do an uh, awful lot of uh, radio uh, circuitry that it's going through. So I'm going to look at it at the ABC point. I'm going to take this off. Okay, and I'm going to put this one on. This is, this is the ABC voltage. Now you see a response curve. The fact that it goes down doesn't mean anything. It's just just the way just the way things are. So there we are, a lovely response curve. We know it's starting here at four uh, four thirty five and ending at four seventy five. We we could actually track back and figure all this out. Uh, you know what the frequencies are and, and all that kind of stuff. The, the shape of this is very much defined by the coils themselves. There's not a lot you can do about it. But let's give it a little tuning now. I'm going to start with the uh, exactly the same order I did it in before. So I'm starting with the one that had the goop on it, provided I can get my tool into it here. Doesn't want to go. Come on, it's just, it's just a slotted screwdriver. Go in. I'm tempted to stick a screwdriver in here, but you know it's inside the back of the radio where uh, there we are. Where there's lots of potential trouble. Now I need a, a flag. I need a uh, I need a piece of tape. So what I'm mum mumbling about here is uh, I have the tool there. I want to put a flag on it uh, so I can rotate it and then rotate it right back to where it was to begin with. Getting my little flag right in here. Just put it on like that. Now I have to stick this guy back in. There he is, he's in. So I know the flag is now showing me, it's a little hard to see the camera, the angle that I'm starting at. So I can come back to it in case I mess everything up, which is really quite likely. <laughs> it's very likely. Let's just see what happens as I turn this. Oh, it got a little higher, didn't it? But the shape, the shape here is beautifully symmetrical. But if I do this, it's not so symmetrical down here anymore. The instructions actually say, so I remember reading this, but let me read it again. Cathode ray alignment is preferred method. Connections for the oscillograph are shown on the schematic. That didn't help. Test oscillator calibration indicator type. First step, that that pointer calibration. Ooh. Well, we're, no, that's that, that that doesn't matter just at this point here. Align here it is. Note: align the IF circuits by means of the oscillograph for a symmetrical curve. Symmetrical is what you're after. Well, that looks pretty darn symmetrical. I just don't think that I can can, can really fix that much. Let's just, for fun, and I'll try turning the other. I don't think there's anything there to fix. That's, that's what I should be saying. Let me let me try this other one here. So this is the uh, first first IF. Ooh, it just turned so easy. So again, you see a funny shape there. Well, how do I know I can't turn the other one and repair that shape? So I'm going down to the other one. This is this is where everything goes out of control. <laughs> this is where it's where we lose it all. Okay, if I turn the other one, can I get it back to a symmetrical shape? I can, but it, it's it's quite a distance from where it was. Hmm. That's why I like the voltmeter method. Okay, let's see if I can restore everything back to the way it was, because I really think it was fine, and I'm just doing some monkey business here. There we go. I'm going to turn this one back. That looks nice and symmetrical there. So there, there is a bandwidth issue here. Um, 
you know, how wide is this? This is like a mouth that's allowing in the signal. If you get the mouth too big, it's going to allow in stuff you don't want to come into the radio. If you narrow it down too small, and this thing really steep, you wouldn't pick up uh, basically the bass sounds and the signal you're listening to. The, uh, although I'm not going to explain this. The treble sounds are close to here. The bass sounds are o over here. Hopefully all the important stuff is, is in this top area here. Because by the time you get down here, you can't hear much. So we have this thing too narrow. The bass will be way down here. You won't hear it because the signal's so weak there. It's got to be up here in the strong strong zone. It's kind of a crummy explanation, but the band and the bandwidth is forced by the uh, more or less forced by how the coils were designed, which is a big part of the radio design. Okay, so we hardly made any changes to the radio, really. Hardly did any adjustments here, just tiny stuff. But you have to do it to know for sure that it's okay. The rest of it is probably going to be a, a lot more important to, to, to adjust. But we should play the radio, and then that's it for today. I've talked a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm worn out here. Okay, I had a, uh, a stroke. A stroke of genius. Look at that. I've hung the antenna from the ceiling <laughs> where it's out of the way. So that's great because I need this antenna connected just about every time I operate the radio because the external antenna connection goes through that antenna. So this is my outdoor antenna, but we should probably try this with just the loop antenna first, or we'll leave it like this. We'll leave it like this. See what we can pick up. Yeah, I'm just in the mood for talking endlessly today. Okay, everything's good. Disconnected the equipment from the radio, shut all my signal generators off, but I have left the AVC meter connected here. Just for fun. Wow. In my shop, there are all kinds of noise signals. Same thing true in your house now. And as you tune through them, many of them are not modulated. So you actually don't hear them. In fact, the radio goes quiet. Goes, goes, goes quiet because of that AVC thing I was talking about. It's like tuning in a radio station and there's nobody talking, no music playing. The radio just goes quiet. That can fool a person into thinking, oh, I've got this tuned to a quiet spot. So it's kind of handy to have this here because this will always show you what level of signal is coming out of the IF, even if you don't hear anything from the speakers. Okay, so let's tune something in. Over this way. I can rotate this a bit. There is the pointer. Is that somebody talking or is that noise? And we're not picking anything up. Not to panic. We are, we are picking up all these noises. No. But no radio stations. Very good chance. It's simply the uh, angle of the antenna up here. I turned off all my signal generators, so I can't, uh... Well, let's see if we can rotate this antenna a little bit here. Uh, 90 degrees would be what we want to do. Something like that. I'm going to have to hold it with my hand. Fortunately, I have two hands. Yeah, clearly I've ruined the radio here. Is that a signal or it's just more noise? So 
So there's an example right there of a, an unmodulated noise signal. If you watch the AVC meter as I tune into that. See, you might, you might think, well, that's a quiet spot. It's not. That's a that's a bad spot. If you're doing testing on the radio on that, but it doesn't want to pick anybody up at all. Ooh, what band am I on? Am I, I'm on the right place. Rotating the antenna back and forth. It's not going to do it. I hear a voice there. Well, not to be dismayed at all, because there's just too many problems with picking stuff up in my shop. Let's take this antenna off and see if it doesn't actually get better. It's possible. When we're on a broadcast band listening to AM radio, it could be that this isn't even connected through. through. I'm not sure of that. No, I don't think it's going to pick it up. Right there. Very weak. Not to be dismayed. Okay, so that's the IF alignment done. Checked a couple different ways. Uh, and so now we will move on, but that'll be tomorrow. And I talked so much today. Oh, my smokes. Tomorrow we'll start doing some of the band alignments. Maybe we'll get through them all. We'll see. Thanks a lot for watching.